What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Snakes on the Brain. Um, today's episode is one that uh, is honestly kind of the bane of a lot of keepers' uh, lives as they, especially as they get more towards keeping multiple species as well as definitely going down the tracks of keeping specific locales or subspecies and things like that. Uh, really quick before we get into the actual topic, quick transparency life updates. Um, we did a few of these things kind of courted in fairly rapid succession. And uh, this will be the first one after a quick little break of recording. During this period of time, we did several uh, reptile expos across Colorado and also in Idaho, gearing up for more potential ones in Colorado as well as one in Wyoming. So, and doing more uh, of the reptile snakes and cakes baking aspect. So that has uh, dominated a good chunk of my time. So I'll, for all the people watching and waiting for the regular reptile content, I do apologize. I have not forgotten about it. I have not given up. I know I made that little update video a little while ago. Still committed to that. Still gonna do more. Uh, but as of right now, the couple that I actually have on the docket, especially the species spotlights, I am kind of mulling over essentially how I'm going to present these exact animals and a big chunk of that actually does have to do with the topic of today's podcast and that's Luna Beller, uh, old St. Bernard that is just kind of coming in here into frame two and then our uh, livestock guarding dog is also laying down there as well but so guest appearance by Luna Bell. Hi Luna Bell. So sorry for the audio listeners out there but you might you probably heard her clack in into the hardwood floors in here. So today's topic at hand after the relatively quick intro for my rambling self is taxonomy. Taxonomy is just a really, really interesting and very frustrating thing when it comes to really anything that has to do with the natural world, especially when we're talking about conservation, keeping practices, captive breeding programs, natural ranges, all of that jazz. So taxonomy, without giving a verbatim Webster's Dictionary Wikipedia definition, is essentially the way that we categorize life on the planet, where we explain both extant and existing animals, or extant and extinct animals, so ones that exist currently and ones that have gone extinct in the past, they will all fall into uh, taxonomic categories. So that's the kingdom, phyla, class, order, genus. I know I did the whole um, video on taxonomy of, a few weeks ago, <laughs> probably a few months ago at this point, good lord. Um, but that is how we are able to describe and help our little squishy brains figure out how to categorize things well and correctly. The big issue that comes into a lot of debate and a headache uh, when the keeping and in, in the keeping community here with reptiles is taxonomy is not a consistent or even a very solid thing. It's a very fluid, nebulous concept, um, which doesn't sound accurate considering we're talking about you know biology and the way we categorize and how we kind of go about things in the world. But as at this point, many of us know science is not a solid concrete thing. It's always changing and taxonomy is definitely a big part of that. Um, and as a good example of this, uh, let's talk about boa imperators. I know I, I'm 99% sure I use this in that taxonomy video. So we have the boa constrictors down in Central and South America, ranging from Argentina all the way up into parts of Mexico. Um, they are categorized in a bunch of different ones, but we generally consider them the common boas and the true red tails is how we generally distinguish them. So the boa constrictor and then the boa imperator. However, for a very long time, the widening consensus was the imperators were a subspecies of the true red tails. So we had boa constrictor constrictor, and those were the Peruvians, the Surinams, the Guyans, um, the, the Brazilians, and then the imperators. And then in the imperators, they were kind of distinguished primarily basically the uh the central american ones so the ones that were not not really the terahuma mountains because that was nebulosa uh, not nebulosa sigma 
that was always kind of its own little thing, but the Central American variety and then the Colombian or common boas were the ones that ranged in uh, Southern Central America all the way down to parts of Northern South America and the Columbia range. Uh, the biggest issue uh, with that is that they did, you know, a lot of the big complaints and yelling about this, it's the DNA phylogenetics. Uh, geneticist, which is how they determine how alike in DNA, to put it very, very broadly and generally. I know that's not the, the best way to describe that, but generally it's, you know, through mitochondrial DNA that we can determine how closely related things are to each other. So for instance, uh, more than likely you've seen it really blew up across a lot of Facebook and even uh, on some non-Facebook websites, actual news sites that they have determined that there are now a total of five species of green anaconda, um, where even just a couple years ago, they determined there was a fourth subspecies outside of the, I believe it's the Bolivian, the green and the yellow. They discovered there was a fourth one and did a video about that. And now there is a northern and a southern of the green anaconda, which kind of makes up that the larger one. And then now, so it's determining whether or not, because they were actually determined that that group that southern and the northern were actually more apart dna wise than even some of those and i believe it again is the bolivian one so separate species of green anaconda there in the case of the boa constrictor and the boa imperator it was determined that the imperators were genetically divert different enough to be considered their own separate species thus we have the boa constrictors and their subsequent, um, that's the flu ball filter doing its 24 hour cycle. So it's just gonna make a bunch of noise right now. I apologize. Actually, yeah, we'll just, we'll probably cut around that. <clears throat> so in the case of the boas, the boa constrictors, we had boa constrictors and the boa imperators and the imperators were considered enough to be uh, genetically separate enough to be considered their own species. So you have the boa constrictors and all of their subsequent subspecies, um, like the longicata and the Argentinian, uh, and then obviously the, the more locale regional stuff like Guyanas and Surinams, which is a whole other thing that we may or may not get to. And then the imperators. And in the case of the imperators, essentially, uh, the, they are kind of all off on their own little one. They're not even really separate subspecies with a lot of those ones, not even um, some of the island ones. They're all just kind of locale-based uh, imperators. And even like the CA and the Colombian, they're all just imperators. However, here in the United States, because of how muddy it gets and because we'd already been keeping them and breeding them and intermingling with them for at that point, probably 10, 20 years at least, uh, the whole pure thing, um, they're all kind of mutts and hybrids, even some of the morphs and stuff. Generally, we consider all the morphs to be uh, the imperators, but they're all intermingled in there as well, which can lead to a lot of issues. So a lot of times people will still say BCI, Boa Constrictor Imperator. Some people will get very upset uh, and butthurt and say just Boa Imperator. They're the whole only thing. It's not a true red tail blah, 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 blah. When in reality, a lot of them even come from the same areas. A lot of them come from the same export of the cotton harvest in the same areas. Um, I mean, it was a whole thing when they, when it was realized or discovered that the Suriname and the Guiana boas are from the same place. They're the same thing. Um, there are now distinctions in bloodlines where typically the Surinams, quotation, quotation, have that more kind of widowy peaked, more silver look, and then the Guianas were more of that kind of purpley look, but the animals were coming year after year, literally out of the same place, and they were just being called at different things when they were the exact same region, exact same areas where they are being field collected, so. <laughs> so that is a whole taxonomic issue when you get into trying to keep genetically distinct uh, species in captivity. Um, and obviously it's a whole other uh, dime bag of nonsense when we talk about North American colubrids where um, it is a constant fight about how we categorize and 
do subsequent species, subspecies, and regionalities of the different North American rat snakes. Um, I mean, not even just like the, I mean, just corn snakes. Some, a lot of people still consider corn snakes and emery rats the same thing. Um, a lot of people will really, really fight you about the Eastern, the gray, and the Western rat snakes. And heck, honestly, even sometimes like the Everglades um, and the yellow rats will kind of all get thrown in there too, where a lot of these new studies that come out uh, that can get a lot of these more veteran style keepers uh, up in arms is number one, the inclusion of microchondrial DNA, DNA analysis, where we can determine how closely related they are together. Um, that can throw a whole other thing, but also kind of where each of these studies get their their base from. So essentially, every time that a scientist, biologist, whoever, grad student, um, is deciding to set course on, I want to try to figure out the correct or reclassify or figure out whatever is going on with the classification of such and such species is they will take a foundation of knowledge. Usually that being hopefully more than one, but several established or peer reviewed and kind of agreed upon by a consensus, fairly accurate papers and other research, uh, other research and conclusions and things like that. And so they'll essentially, they'll take that and it'll take the next step forward. Uh, the big problem is, is that also a lot of the times, um, some of that research is not wholly founded well, it could be discredited. Um, and then there's also a lot of times where they will only take like a portion of that foundation and just kind of set aside because it didn't really fall in line with what they were kind of hoping to uh, bring to light. But disregarding some information of that topic or of that base part of information research uh, essentially leads to not really a bet, a good foundation or a good start for your own research. And so, you know, there will be a really good research paper, well-researched thing about the Eastern rats that are now considered separate from the Western or the Texas rats and even the gray rats. Um, obviously there are ranges that overlap and that is another part of contention um, that also has to do with the categorization of like species and subspecies is geographic isolation. Um, then they say like, okay, this paper says, and I'm not quoting a specific paper here. This is just, so this paper has categorized that the Eastern rats, so the black rats um, and the ones that are found, and even some of the grayer ones that are found along the East part, uh, the Eastern part of the United States, that's their own thing. They are the Eastern rats. And this one says, these are these more central located ones. These are the gray rats. And then over here is the Western rats. And then like the yellows and the Everglades are kind of their own thing and Emery's are kind of their own thing. Um, and then another guy reads this paper, maybe not necessarily 100% of it or doesn't do something quite right, but he wants to establish that the grays aren't a real thing. The grays are just regionality intergrades between Westerns and Easterns. And so he will try to use essentially overlap in geographies or um, animals that look very similar in the case, but are necessarily uh, biologically different. The orbital, uh, the orbital and the labial scale counts are even uh, inconsistent on those things, but he will take some of that information and then go and conclude that. Or another person will take that paper that came out more recently as a peer-reviewed one, but not necessarily a consensus one, that was roughly based on another more highly re re uh, accredited one, and say, I want to include and just say the Eastern rats are the striped rats, so the Everglades and the yellows, and then the grays, or the, east, the grays are actually an eastern rat, so I want a southern rat one. And then so the eastern rats are going to be all of the grays and the blacks and all of the blotched ones. So the ones that aren't striped, the ones that are blotched as adults. And then so then I'm going to have the westerns, the blotched, and the striped. 
And so that's what I want to do. And so you can see, and again, I'm not calling the thing anything out in particular. A lot of this thinking has been used in multiple different research papers or points to prove essentially. And so you end up dealing with a lot of these papers that are coming out that use a lot of really good terminology and use a lot of good really base um, knowledge, but just kind of end up falling the wayside one way or the other based on that person's agenda, which can lead to a lot of issues and controversy um, about how things are being called, um, both scientifically as well as colloquially. Um, you know, for, for instance, when I did my uh, Eastern or Black Rat video, the North American Rat Snake videos, you know, I'd already gone through a lot of these papers and I try to do my best to be very uh, precise about how I say these things. And yeah, I absolutely make mistakes too. But that's why it took me a long time to put that video out, was essentially trying to determine the general consensus as well as the most agreed upon opinions of a lot of both the zoological, biological, more scientific community as well as a lot of those keepers. Um, and, you know, so because I don't know too many, um, a lot of very specific Kluber keepers, I know like two or three that obviously I'd gained opinions from, but, and so I, you know, and to a Facebook group, I was saying, okay, here's the kind of consensus in general that, you know, I, I made videos, here's this kind of consensus. What do all of you people consider to be this type of rat snake? Here is the, here it is. This is the kind of general consensus as of like these two or three papers. But I want your opinions, not I want to know what they are. Just what do you consider to be X, Y, and Z? And a lot of people um, were actually really good about it. They were putting in there that, you know, they started to quote, you know, the paper, one of the couple papers that I had referenced, they had started to quote, um, other papers that I wasn't aware of, uh, other people that were uh, brought to light uh, issues that it, some uh, states, because each state has different laws, um, some states' DNRs do not recognize certain papers. Therefore, even though new papers that were coming out more recently wouldn't recognize a paper that that research was based on, so that one was left out. Therefore, certain animals in that state aren't allowed to be kept cap in, in captive conditions. So going through all these things, but there was one old school guy, uh, and he is pretty well known in the community. Like if you go to, you know, like your NARBC show or your larger reptile show, and there's like the eco booth that has all of the really cool hurt books, uh, he's in a couple of those. Let's just put it that way. And he, I think I'm, I'm going to err on the side of ignorance or complaint, uh, or, uh, well-meaning before malice, um, ignorance before malice. But I think he was trying to be well-meaning. He just wasn't very nice about it. Um, where he was saying that, look at all of this really good information, but you me specifically, am not ready to go ahead and quote these people or put out my own information about it because I'm just kind of picking at individual quotes that he is unaware of the, at this point, three to four months of on and off research that I have done into trying to recontextualize and be concise and figure out the most appropriate way, the most accurate, the most correct way to present this very uh, volatile information. And he even did like the, the Jeff Goldblum, Ian Malcolm quote from Jurassic Park at me. Uh, you know, the one that uh, your scientists took was there and then they took the next step and they didn't give any credit to these, to these things. Um, and he just had no idea about that. And like I said, I think he was trying to say it as, you know, there's so many YouTubers and pet tubers out there that just uh, you know, read a Wikipedia article and then word vomit it back up and present it as their own or don't have the whole picture or trying to put their spin on it, which he's not, he's not wrong about by any means. Um, but just kind of unaware about that. And we kind of had our own little separate conversation about that. And I think he just kind of like dropped it or just kind of gave up or whatever. Um, we never really came to like a solid agreement, but 
just kind of fizzled out as, which is I'm perfectly acceptable via social media, in all honesty. As long as we're not screaming at each other and trying to dox each other, I think we could both come across pretty well. Um, but that's just the whole thing about taxonomy. And the whole reason why I brought up this topic today was because I watched a video uh, that Clint did with Envy Reptiles. So for people who aren't aware, Envy Reptiles, they're kind of like the premier Pituophis, the bull pine gopher uh, family uh, breeders here in the States. Uh, they do a lot of really cool stuff and they even do a lot of milks and kings and things as well. And Clint was explaining, um, like they were talking about essentially the breakdown of Pituophis um, and talking about whether or not Catenifer, so Catenifer being the essentially gopher snake species, and then, you know, inside of the gopher snake species, you have Catenifer, Catenifer, Desert Cola, Aphinus, so, you know, the Greater Basins, the Pacifics, uh, the Sonorans, yada, yada, yada. And Clint was definitely out of his element uh, for that video. And I'm not trying to dog on Clint by any means. He's a very knowledgeable um, he's an actual herpetologist, really, really knowledgeable, very good content creator, but you could tell that he was definitely out of his element in that. Um, but they were essentially, they were kind of talking about the different uh, subspecies and species that make up the pitch wolfus genus. So, you know, they were talking about um, the Jani, so the pine snake, the Mexican pine snakes. They were talking about the actual pine snakes, so all the Melanolucus. They were talking about Ruth Vinai, the Louisiana pine snakes, and like the vertebrales, the Cape gophers. Um, and, you know, Clint was kind of going through notes on his phone and wasn't really doing that great of a job kind of like presenting his, like the determinations he was making through. They kind of put up a little bit of info on the screen, but it wasn't super, super clear. But essentially he was just trying to explain how, you know, if we want to establish Catenifer and we want to, we want to keep Catenifer like as a species, we need to actually keep Catenifer as its own. And he's looking back at like the evolutionary uh, trees that kind of go back in there and how they branch off into one. So they go back, the farther you go back, the common ancestries and where they branch off in here. So, you know, if we want to keep Catenifer, uh, Ruth and I, Louisiana Pine Snake has to be a Catenifer. The Vertebralis has to be a Catenifer. Okay, so then the Pine Snakes. The, so the Louisiana Pine Snake is now not its own species. It needs to stay Catenifer based on uh, taxonomy and the evolutionary branch trees. And so the three different uh, pine snakes, the Northerns, the Blacks, and the Southerns, they can stay Melanolucus. They don't have to be Catenifer. But then you have like the two Northern pine snakes, which is like a whole thing. And he's saying that, uh, he again, out of his element, not, he was really trying to kind of consolidate and trying to be concise, but it just, it wasn't really working too, too well for him. But he was saying that it needed to be, you know, they can be the pine snakes, but they don't need to be their own Depi, Depi, Depi Jani. They need to be Melanolucus, Depi Jani, um, you know, that type of thing. Or, um, and I am not being 100% sure, I'm potentially misquoting him a little bit, but essentially he was trying to, trying to make it to where, like, all of the kind of branching out things that scientists and people have kind of come to conclusions on their own may have had missteps along the way. And if we want to try to recontextualize the way things are kept, or we, the way we want to keep these groups the way that we want them to, or a specific way, we might need to rethink of how evolutionary things worked out, or how we've been branching things, and, and yada, yada, yada. And so that was just a really good example of how, how we break down species and um, subspecies and regionalities and all that other stuff is just a whole, whole mess. You know, another example being like the fox snakes that I've talked about and uh, Dave Kaufman talked about how they use geographic isolation to determine kind of the difference between, at least in the northern part of the range, the eastern and the western fox snakes, um, as the Mississippi River being a geographical barrier between the two separate populations, even though they have been documented crossing the Mississippi even at that range, as well as um, animals of typically that look phenotypically like the westerns are found east of the Mississippi and vice versa. So it's a whole mess. Um, so it seems like, you know, taxonomy is just like this whole big dumb thing. However, taxonomy can be very beneficial and even life-saving at times. In fact, they 
uh, recently. I think it was in 2017 they started, and I think they kind of concluded in 2022 or 2023. Uh, they were doing a recategorizing and trying to redefine the different species and subspecies of cobra found throughout India and Nepal and those surrounding regions. There are several different uh, cobras there. And a big reason why was, number one, animals were coming up that they weren't entirely sure were the same species or subspecies. Um, but there was also a lot of human-snake overlap and conflict in those areas. There's a lot of snake bites, a lot of fatal snake bites in those areas. Um, and some of those, uh, some of those elapids have different types of venom. So trying to figure out exactly the type of animals that are found in these specific areas that can look specific ways can be life-saving to know which anti-venom to give to people when they are bitten and potentially envenomated by specific types of cobras. So taxonomy and the reevaluation um, and the recategorization can be a very, very good thing. So that's why it's, you know, you can't sit there and just completely poo-poo on taxonomy and how we categorize things and everything like that. I'm aware that that part is kind of out of our ballpark to say for us as keepers, but it's something that I think that we as a whole need to keep a more open mind and a broader idea about that. Yeah, is it annoying that now, you know, for the last 22 years, I've been keeping these black rats and now I'm technically wrong. If I'm going to call them a black rat, I need to be start be calling them Eastern rats or Texas rat snake, that isn't a thing anymore. Um, and I am, you know, a backwards thinking person that for wanting to call my leucistic or my scaleless rat snakes, Texas rat snakes, not Western rat snakes. Like that's just not, it's not a good look in general, but it was just something that's been on my mind a lot recently uh, was just that, you know, and it, it comes up a lot, especially with the whole taxonomy thing. Um, as I said at the beginning of this, that that's kind of, I'm kind of stuck where, you know, I got, I have good B-roll, I have good footage, I've got some, I started to do research into a specific type of species, but as it turns out, um, because there's like four or five different common names for two or three different species and subspecies that are found in a very small geographic area, that there have now been a lot of determinations that this species is now actually two different species. So it used to be a species and then a subspecies. And that subspecies is now its own. And that new one may even have its own subspecies as well. So you'll have this one that was the nominant of that original one. And then you have the one that is now its own that now has two subspecies. So our but and then they, they talk about kind of, you know, the physiological differences of like, you know, the, the length and the body girth and the head width. However, ones that are always categorized as this other one, now separate one, as kind of always the same one from one specific place, even having its own regional name, share those phenotypical traits of that original one over here. Sorry for the audio listeners again. Um, basically new one. So there's one for a long time called a bunch of different things and there are two different subspecies, but one of those subspecies is now its own. And that one now has two different subspecies that they say looks a little bit different from that very first one that it split off from, but they look identical and it's a very variable in coloration looking animal as well, both in pattern and in color and even behavior. One is not strictly arboreal or terrestrial, they will kind of do both. So theoretically, I need to figure out a way to either talk about that whole thing and not, you know, verbal diarrhea it up is what happened in, you know, my very first uh, Texas or Western rat snake video. Or do I make two separate ones that are much shorter that doesn't have the usual type of good content that I like to present? And so that's where I've been kind of muddling it over. And that's what happens a lot of the times when uh, people will ask for a specific type of uh, species spotlight video, number one is either can I get a lot of good information, consistent information? Another one is can I get good video of it? Because just doing the pictures for a species spotlight, I don't think is good enough for, especially for a YouTube, a video content. And then third of which is can I concisely put it out there 
excuse me, to where it's digestible and it's easy to understand. So that's just kind of uh, today's little snakes on the brain. That's what I've been thinking about for a while. And that's kind of what, uh, again, the whole point of this little mini series, uh, mini series, but the kind of, you know, condensed solo ones of me just kind of muttering at, at you guys is all about just kind of stuff that sticks with me. Uh, fun side note, hopefully you guys have stuck with me this long. I have talked to a couple people. They have said that they're interested in doing uh, the more longer actual dialogue podcasts. And I have one that he is actually ready to go at any point. Um, I'm tr I like to try to get a few lined up and then record them so that way I can kind of put them out um, relatively close together. Or would you guys rather have a more longer format relatively soon and hopefully I just can come across with longer ones and you guys are kind of enjoying this uh, smaller, still long, but can more short uh, format as well. So let me know what your opinions about that are. Uh, let me know about your opinions about how this is going as well. Like I said, this is the first one uh, outside of that initial batch that I recorded right away. And hopefully you guys are stuck around this long. How are you enjoying this? Do you like the format? What do you think? What do you want me to change? And would you like me to just have uh, when I can get a person to do so and then put it out as soon as possible? So thank you all so much. Um, if you are listening, thank you all so much. If you are watching, please like, subscribe, share with all of your friends. Thank you all so much. Hope you all are having a great day and we'll check you next time.